would ever win one year ago. No, no. I didn't expect anything. I didn't um, felt anything like winning or something. And I wouldn't dare to think about it during this Eurovision time, if I'm honest, those two weeks of rehearsing and being in Copenhagen. Um, and after the semi-final, people wouldn't stop saying by passing on, on, on you know, hallway or stuff, you're gonna win, you're gonna win. And I'm, I'm really like, please don't, don't say that, please, <laughs> yeah, please. No. because, you know, and even, even um, the moment I had actually won, because the last thing you would do is doing the math and starting to, oh, there are no different professionals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just thought there was this, this, this glitter you know, raining down. Like, no, no, stop, stop. There are still countries to go. Why would you do that? That's bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> and bad manners. <laughs> you were a very gracious host, and you won with one of the biggest points margin. And I think it's fair to say you changed perceptions of Austria for many people. Did it feel that big to you? Well, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really dare to say that I changed anything because. I mean, I got so many messages, you know, with social media, people are very fast by sending information. And there were people out there truly saying that uh, they got inspired by what I did and said. And I really can't, it's hard for me to believe, but because I, it's just me, you know, it's just me saying what I think is right, <laughs> it's not the alternative truth. But you know, in show business, everyone goes on a journey. Everyone <laughs> is on a journey. And yours, from a very small conservative part of Austria, and in Britain we love to use the word conservative about Austria, which yeah. they go together. Yeah. And then you're on the Eurovision stage. And tell us, if you don't want to talk about what you changed in Austria, tell us what changed in you this year. Tell us uh, about going to the Golden Globes, about what kind of a life you've had since winning. Everything changed. Everything changed. And, uh, I'm basically living my dream, and, and I really accept that very <coughs> Because, you know, it's, um, I still can't believe that there are actually people out there all around the globe mm -hmm. knowing my name, listening to my music, and getting all these invitations like the Golden Globe you managed, uh, uh, mentioned. Um, that was just, I mean, being in one room with Meryl Streep, getting the same air. Stealing her shoes. That was. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, that was one of the highlights and having a little chat with Felicity Huffman on the toilet was really <laughs> one of the most intense notes. But <laughs> it was really a great experience. And I met Ban Ki-moon, one of the most important people when it comes to human rights. And I, you know, even, even the fact that he found it necessary to meet me was just mind-blowing. And we've been talking a lot in the boring part of the day about uh, what makes us European. Did you find that Americans <coughs> had heard of Eurovision? Were you the first time some of these people had heard of the event? Um, <coughs> well, going to Los Angeles and meeting um, some, some, especially people from the LGBT community, they said, well, I, I haven't heard from Eurovision before, and I think it's fabulous. And I thought, yeah, we know. <laughs> Why don't you know? But yeah, um, some people heard of the Eurovision because of, of they heard of the bearded lady winning. One thing I know about you, because I, I saw this for myself in a small venue last year, is your love of a good song. And we've done lots of talking today, and we haven't spoken about what makes a great song. What What is the answer, do you think? Um, a great song is, obviously, for each and everyone, a different kind of song. And But at the end of the day, it needs to touch people. It needs to be authentic, and um, for me, <coughs> every song that I sing, whether it's my own or a cover, I really feel it, and it would be like, when I sing, my heart will go on, I, I see myself channeling Celine Dion, being <laughs> Celine Dion in this song. <laughs> but no, seriously, I, I think that, that, well, at least that's what touches me, you know, authenticity. And for us in, in London last yes. year. Why do you like that song? What is it about, if you think about it, maybe you want to sing a little bit of it. What is it about? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, with, with my heart we're gone, I, I mean, it's ridiculously dramatic. 
dramatic. <laughs> what I love. <laughs> it's it's so much drama and it gets bigger and bigger and I just I just love that and I mean by by Celine Dion you know I think we experience so many artists over the time getting better and better and better but Celine Dion I've seen videos of her at the age of 11 12 singing flawless and she's a bit of a diva no she's not <laughs> I don't know her but she <coughs> Well, do you think she's a diva? Well, you hear things about her, don't oh. you? <laughs> but um, do you think there's a duet one day coming? <laughs> well, I, well I, I dream of singing with her, but I, I wouldn't dare to ask you. Rise Like a Phoenix, a, a lovely song, love is a bad word, but a build, a song that you chose to perform static. We spoke about that yeah. earlier. Yeah. And how did you take that decision? All of the technology on offer, you could have swept out, you could have moved, but you, you stayed static. Mm -hmm. well, why did you take that decision? Because I just love to stand still. <laughs> also, um, we are seeing you in the green room this year. We will see you, and you, Austria is hosting. And we've seen that the fans are booing Russia. They booed them in London, they booed them in Copenhagen. What do you think of the booing of Russia? I think that's awful. I really, um, because um, especially in Copenhagen, um, experience this situation and those two girls were singing their heart out, you know, doing what they love the most, performing for so many people. And it's not them to blame what is happening in Russia, you know. I mean, I understand it that the audience wanted to send a message, but it was on their backs, and that's just, I feel so sorry, I felt so sorry for them, because they were just, they were just singing like everybody else, and they, it's nothing to blame on them, they should get applause as everybody else. And you'll be in a powerful position, if it happens again in Austria, you will be in the green room. I have to, I have to turn into everybody's grandmother. Oh. <laughs> I will, I will, I will. Don't shoot that. <laughs> no, because no, seriously, I don't think that's okay. Because these are artists, and they have nothing to do with those ridiculous laws. Can we talk about Tom? Sure. Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> so I alluded to the journey that in show business everyone goes on. Yes. And Conchita, yours began with Tom. Exactly. So, uh, did he like Eurovision? <laughs> oh, he loved Eurovision. <laughs> no, truly, um, I'm a Eurovision fan as long as I can remember. And I watched it with, you know, that was a family happening. And by the age of, I don't know, seven, ten, something, that was the only night where we were allowed to stay up late. You know, I mean, that was reason enough to watch it because, well, yeah, funny. <laughs> and, but over the years, I truly fell in love with the songs, the drama, the costumes, the light, the, the fans, and all that, you know, and year by year, and one day I said to my mom, you know, one day I'm gonna be there. And I really tried hard for years and years to be on this stage, and I really bothered the Austrian uh, broadcast is so bad. And you were rather up, the public voted for you in large number in 2012, I mean. Exactly. But when did it become clear to you that it was Conchita's shoes that were going to put you on the Eurovision stage, not Tom's sneakers? Um, well, that was, I, um, I made a decision about, it was 2011. You know, I'm doing drag since I'm 14, but not in a, not in a regular way. And in 2011, a friend of mine offered me to host the Bolesque show, and it was every Saturday. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna do it as a bearded lady because I don't want to shave every week. <laughs> and so that, that, that's how Conchita came about, and I really enjoyed it. And even in this, where you might think it's a very open-minded scene, um, I earned kind of criticism. And I realized with them, okay, wow, this beard actually is way more than I thought. And it's not glamour, it's not lipstick, it's confusing. Yeah. I want to move off this with one last question, really, which is... We already reached the last question. No, just about Tom, the last question about Tom. Which is, I love to talk. I think they love to listen. It, has the rise of Conchita put Tom down? Is Tom smaller because Conchita is bigger? No, no. 
definitely not. Um, with being Conchita and Tom in my private life, everything is so well balanced that I can re really live 100% in every way of my life. Are you sharing your private life in some way? With my friends. <laughs> so? Yeah, many. Okay. <laughs> Any one special one? No, I'm in love with my life. So, so we